one of the things you see in kind of Islamic modernists or kind of progressive Muslims is, uh, let's just say, a significantly reduced level of humility, a, a, a certainty about their moral or scientific view of the world. Mm. And not being willing to say, like, you know what, maybe God and the prophet know better than us on something. That's, I think, the, the what's really at issue. So, in some ways, the these debates, although they might be about Abu Huraira or about you know whether we believe hadith or not, mm. that's not really what the debate is. The debate is how willing are we to subordinate what people around us are saying are the certainties, the moral certainties, the mm. political certainties, whatever, scientific certainties of our world. Mm. How willing are we saying these are more powerful than the message of God and his prophet? That's what we're, we're saying. That's the, the debate, right? Yeah. Or are we saying that if we're going to be Muslim, it can only be an Islam that is really defined by, let's say, progressive sensibilities? Dr. Jonathan Brown, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and welcome to the Thinking Muslim podcast. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, it's great to have you with us. Um, Dr. Brown, Muslims around the world hold with immense respect the hadith of the Messenger. These are his recorded words, his actions, and his silence on an issue. Today, Dr. Brown, I want to explore some, in some depth, the hadith, its formulation, how we know they actually reflect the traditions of the Prophet ﷺ, its value in comparison to the Qur'an, the sunnah as a source of sharia, and some of the common misunderstandings and arguments uh, by some, maybe the orientalists and the modernists, who propose arguments against adopting the hadith as a source of sharia. Now let's start with a definition of what the hadith are. Um, how would you define the hadith and its value from an Islamic standpoint? Okay, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So, it's a big, big topic. But I'm happy to, you know, this is the Thinking Muslim podcast. Yes. So, we have some time. We do have time. Uh, You've got a talk in two and a half hours time to give. Yeah, and I get I have nothing else to do in the, in the I could I, I'll I'll talk until you collapse. It'll like collapse. I'll just bring you like you know at you know some kind of adrenaline shots or something. Inshallah. So um yeah, so hadiths are this act this question is actually the sub question of an initial question, but I'll answer the sub question first. So the Please. the second question. So, so hadiths are reports about something, as you said, that the the Prophet Laysalam said or did, or things that were done in his presence. And to which he did not object, right? So the idea is if, if something were done in his presence, yeah. he doesn't object to it, it means that it's allowed to do. Um, so, uh, for example, like um, uh, certain kinds of, of birth control, uh, which I won't get into because audiences tend to be a bit squeamish, which is actually very un-Muslim, <laughs> right? Yes. Muslim scholars are always very happy to talk about even uh, the most bodily intimate bodily things, but uh, certain types of um, birth control were mentioned, were being done in his time. And he did not, he never, he never said it's, you know, it, he never said, do this, it's okay, but he, he never objected to it. Right. Um, so uh, then we, uh, we know that this is per permissible, right? So the, each hadith is, consists of two parts. It consists of the text of the hadith, which is called the metan. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the chain of transmission by which the hadith arrived at some collector or maybe multiple collectors mm -hmm. who write this down and, and put it in a compilation. Mm -hmm. I mean, technically, hadiths have their isnad, their chain of transmission, all the way to us today. So, I mean, today, for example, there's people you can uh, narrate hadiths via contiguous isnads back to the prophet, the shortest ones would be probably like 15 to 20 change of uh, transmitters right. um, back to the prophet, alayhi salam. By all through extremely long-lived people. So we're being very selective about that, right? Yeah. So people who are extremely long-lived. Right. Now, um, the, the question of what is hadith is actually, a lot of times what people mean by that is, what is the sunnah of the Prophet? Yes. So the sunnah of the Prophet, sunnah in pre-Islamic Arabia is uh, just the way of the people. So there's like pre-Islamic verses of poetry that talk about 
um, you know, likulli qawmin sunnatuha wa imamuha, right? So every every tribe, every people has their own sunnah and their own imam, their own leader. So uh, it's like the way, if you think of a, the Mandalorian TV show, hmm. and they say like, this is the way. The sunnah is the way of the prophet, they say salam. Right. right? Uh, the actual kind of technical definitions for sunnah, yes. uh, the, you could find, for example, the famous Indian scholar Shah Wali Allah, who died in 1762, common era. He says, he talks about the sunnah as the infallible application of the book of God, right? So it's the Quran, the sunnah is the Quran applied by an infallible interpreter, namely mm. the messenger of God, mm. based on Islam. Another way to think about the sunnah, which is also correct, right, is to say that it's the normative precedent of the Prophet Muhammad. So um, why do I say normative precedent? So normative meaning that it has kind of moral force. It has authority over us. Yeah. It, it, it commands us. Uh, because there's other aspects of the Prophet's precedent that are not normative. For example, you know, you're Muslim. I'm Muslim, but you're wearing basically what originated as an Ottoman hunting jacket. This is what the sport coat is. This can you believe that? This is like you know, in your Worcester and Jeeves. This is the stuff they wear when they're like biking and going hunting. This is their sports clothing when yes. they're playing like cricket. How now it you... now this is formal clothing. What 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 gives it away? What makes this an Ottoman hunting? This jacket? is what this is what we're both wearing. Really? It's this like this this actual design, like a coat, a jacket yeah. that yes. we wear is. Yeah. Originated in the 1700s is Ottoman Serious, hunting jacket, really? yeah, okay. as far as I know. Oh. And then you're wearing this like uh, cotton thing, yes, a shirt. buttons, right? Yes. And then you've got these things on your eyes, uh, which I, I dig. It's sort of a Buddy Holly style, right? <laughs> a Malcolm X. Yeah, maybe. Malcolm. Okay, well, wait, <laughs> scratch the Buddy Holly. But so that maybe so then and then you know, but and I'm Muslim, yes. And yet neither of us are wearing. What the Prophet used to wear. Right. What did the Prophet used to wear? Do you know? Yeah. yeah, that's a debatable issue. It depends who you speak to, I think. But I don't, I don't know. We don't, see, we don't even know. I mean, right. there is an answer. But oh. like, we don't even know. I mean, we, we, if we regular Muslim wouldn't even know the answer because True. it was decided very early on in the, in the Muslim community during the time of the Companions of the Prophet. That dress is not normative, right? So as long as, as, long as, we're, as, long as our auras are covered yes. and as long as we're dressed like, you know, for example, technically, I could do this podcast with no shirt on. I could do this podcast topless, right. and my outer would be covered. Yes, but that would be be just be disgraceful. Yes. Plus, everyone in the audience would feel bad about themselves. Yes, but <laughs> that's a pretty good joke. <laughs> so then, the point is, uh, the, it was decided very early on in the Muslim community yeah. that. As long as you're within the bound, the, the the kind of outer limits of what the Sharia rules are. For example, we're not wearing silk. Yeah. Men can't wear silk, right? Of course, yes. Um, but other than that, our dress, we don't follow how the Prophet dressed. You're right. And this is it's interesting. So you can see in like some of the early Muslim, like Sunni theological texts, you'll have, you know, we believe in angels, we believe in messengers, we believe in fate, we believe in, you know, things like this. And then you say, we believe in the permissibility of wearing pants. Why is that in a theological? Why is that in a theological text, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's actually an important statement about your epistemology, like about how you derive your norms and your and your kind of your, the law of, of in your faith, right? Which is to say, wearing pants and wearing clothes that the Prophet Laysasam did not wear, he didn't wear pants, right? Is acceptable. We're not uh we his dress is not normative for us. Now if you and I decided to imitate the Prophet of God, the Quran says the Prophet is Uswatun Hasana, right? He's a goodly example. So let's say we're we're like, we're gonna dress exactly like the Prophet. We're gonna mm. sleep on our right sides, facing the Kaaba. Mm. We're gonna uh, break our fasts on dates and water. We're gonna do, we're gonna follow the Prophet's life in as many ways as we can, yeah. and including dressing like him. Then, you know, God would in theory reward us because we're emulating the prophet right. we could do that yeah but it's not required right? right it's not even necessarily recommended okay okay so the sunnah is the normative precedent of the messenger of god yes now uh one of the the the, the central issues one of the central kind of engines driving islamic intellectual tradition is the relationship between the quran and the sunnah yes right um <clears throat> 
And this always surprises students when I tell them this, but it actually shouldn't surprise students. And it wouldn't surprise Muslim scholars, including the earliest Muslim scholars. It would not surprise them. But I ask my students, I say, what is more powerful, the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet? What do you think? Well, one of my questions is, uh, do we re regard both to be of equal equal precedence, equal power? But you're you're answering you're asking a question, right? You have to answer the question. Um, well, I'm going to go with um, we we regard them to be equal of equal weight. Okay, that's that's a safe answer. Yes, I've actually never heard someone give that answer. You're very you're very <laughs> cautious. That's good. That's good. I, yeah, it's so in Britain, we're, yeah, we're cautious people. So the you know normally you ask them what sometimes they say, yeah. well, obviously the Quran. Oh, yes, especially if they're kind of like, uh, you know, maybe they're a little bit on the liberal side. Not that, there's anything wrong, not that there's anything wrong with that, right? They definitely say the Quran, you know? Yes. I don't, don't deal with these hadiths, right? Yes. So, but when you go back and again, look in the earliest texts we have in the Islamic tradition, the mm. earliest texts we have, yes. you see figures like a Zuhri. He died 124 Hijri, 742 Common Era. Yahya bin Abi Kathir, I think he died 127 Hijri. Um, uh, Allahumma says to Muhammad, al uh, who died about 773 Common Era. Mm. Abdurrahman al a great scholar who died in Beirut. You can see his uh, grave in Beirut if you go today. Oh, um, you'll see this quote, which is the book, the Quran, did not come to rule over the Sunnah. The Sunnah came to rule over the Quran. Okay. Right. And you also see sayings like this. The Sunnah, the, sorry, the Quran needs the Sunnah more than the Sunnah needs the Quran. Right. I tell this to students, they're like, oh, what is this? Uh, you know, they're like throwing their papers up in the air, like, Astaghfirullah, what are you talking about? Yeah. I say, students, relax. You know, look, there's no debate ontologically from mm. the perspective of like being. Mm. The Quran is obviously prior to and superior to the Sunnah of the Prophet. Like, the Quran is the word of God. Yes. The Sunnah of the Prophet is the you know the word and the actions of a human being. Even if it's an inspired human being, it's still a human being, right? Yeah. If it weren't for the Quran, if it weren't for the revelation, there would be no prophets, prophecy, right? So you know, prophecy is a product of God intervening in history. Hmm. So if it weren't for that divine intervention, you don't have prophecy. So the the Quran is sort of ontologically prior to and superior to the Sunnah of the Prophet. But hermeneutically, right? Hermeneutics is the, sci the, the kind of study of interpretation, the study of understanding. Hermeneutically, the Sunnah of the Prophet is more powerful than the Quran, right? right? And this is actually, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, I don't want to, I, I don't like to, you know, kind of dump on Western scholarship, but in the kind of 20th century, a group of Western literary scholars realized that the real the real power in a text lies not in the author but in the interpreter. Mm. Which this is Muslims understood this, you know, at the very beginning of the Islamic tradition, right? Which is the inter the interpreter has the power. Right. Imagine this: um, you're uh, there's like a you know you're looking you're looking you're out on the street here and there's a window and there's maybe something beautiful inside here. Yeah. Let's say this is England, so there's a Christmas tree. It's yeah. Christmas time, there's Christmas trees, and you're outside, it's like very Dickensian. You're looking in, you got like the, the, the gloves with no fingers on them, yeah. you got the, like the weird hat, okay? And you're looking in, and the window is distorted. The window is, so what is what are you seeing? Like what controls what you're seeing? You don't even actually know what's inside. You only know what's coming through the window, right? So if the window distorts what you're seeing or changes what it is, or even, gives a whole new image, that's what you see. Right. The window is holding the power, that the lens through which you see is actually controlling the whole process. So in a, a system where you interpret, uh, an interpretive tradition, yes. like let's say um, the American legal tradition, what is the meaning of the Constitution, hmm. for example? It doesn't matter what the Constitution says. I mean, you don't even need to read the Constitution because what matters is 
the interpretation of the Supreme Court. Yes. And it doesn't matter what the previous interpretations of the Supreme Court are. What matters is the most recent interpretation of the Supreme Court. They define what that means. Right. Right. So the in an interpretive system, you think of it like an onion. Yeah. That the inner, the core of the onion is, of course, the, the heart of the onion. But it's the outer layers that we that through which we perceive that core. Hmm. So the Sun we Muslim scholars and all Muslim scholars agreed with this. Sunni, Shia, even like, you know, Ismaili, for example, scholars think this. Hmm. All of them have always read the Quran through the Sunnah of the Prophet. You read the Quran through the Sunnah of the Prophet. Yes. Right? The Sunnah of the Prophet explains the Quran. So the Quran tells us to pray. Hmm. The Quran doesn't say how to pray. The Quran doesn't explicitly say when to pray. The hmm. Quran doesn't tell us what to do if we make a mistake in our prayer. The Quran doesn't tell us what to do. You know, when it's Friday prayer, right? right. Jum'ah prayer. So these things all are explained in the Quran. Right. Oh, sorry, in the Sunnah of the Prophet. Yes. Um, the Sunnah of the Prophet adds to the Quran. So like my kids the other day, they were saying, uh, I don't know why. They're like, can we eat uh, lion meat? They're like, we want to eat. I don't know what we said. We were like some... Looking at something, and it was a guy who like tries travels and eats weird foods in yeah. places, and he's yeah. like, he went to some country, and he's like, they got this lion meat hamburger, and my yeah. kids are like, oh, I want the lion meat hamburger. Yeah. So I was like, I can't eat that. Yes. Although apparently some Muslim scholars say you can, but anyway, in general, why the Quran doesn't say don't eat lion meat, right? The Quran says blood is prohibited, carrion is prohibited, pork is prohibited, but. Animals with canines are prohibited too, carnivores, yeah. because the prophet, Nahan Kulidi and Yab, right? So anything that has canines, also prohibited. Yes. Adds to the Quran. Uh, the, very importantly, the Sunnah specifies the Quran. Right. Specifies it, restricts it. Mm. So, and this is where I, I find, I mean, again, I don't want to, I got nothing but love for all my Muslim brothers and sisters, but sometimes people will come and say, Yahi, you know, I don't want to deal with hadiths. Don't tell me the sunnah of the prophet. Oh, look, I'm, I just follow the Quran. Hmm. I'll be like, oh, really? So um, do you think like, let's say I steal this pen from, is this a pen? This is extremely heavy. It's a stylus. for, Like it's a computer pen. Okay. So let's say I steal this computer pen. Well, let's pretend it's a regular pen, okay? From this table. Yeah. Quranically, what's the punishment for me? The punishment is I get my hand chopped off, hmm. right? Right, the, I get my hand chopped off for stealing this. Let's let's not in this stylus. These things can be kind of expensive. Let's pretend this is just some cheap pen you get in a hotel. Hmm. According to the Quran alone, I get my hand chopped off. Yes, the Sunnah of the Prophet restricts it. Uh -huh. So the Prophet from the Prophet Hadith, we know, for example, that the item has to be above a certain value. If it's below a certain value, you're not going to get your hand chopped off. You're just going to get, you know, you have to return the item. You get yelled at. You you have, you have you know you get smacked a bunch of times with a paddle. You get put in prison. Whatever the different whatever the punishments that we we've decided on are. Okay, then let's say okay, uh, we're here in the studio. Let's say this is this is like an extremely expensive computer stylus, yes. right? So this is like a thousand dollars. That's above the limit. I steal it. We know from the Sunnah of the Prophet, from the Hadith and the Prophet, and the Sunnah of Abu Dawood and other collections that. The item has to be in what's called hirs. Hirs means a secure, loca lo secure location. So you, you left it out on the table. If I take this, I, I, again, I've committed a crime. I can get dragged into court. Hmm. You're going to say, this guy stole my stylus. I'm going to get smacked or put in prison or whatever the punishment that is just determined in what's called tazir punishment. Right. right? But I'm not going to get my hand chopped off. Um, so it has to be in a secure location. But let's say... You have this like kind of locked drawer here. You put the stylus in there. Yeah. But I'm really intent on getting this thing. So I come in. No one's here. You have like a little mask on and everything. I Jimmy opened the door, drawer and I take the stylus. Yeah. I get caught. Take me into the court. I'm, you know, they perp walk me into the court. You're there. It's like, look, now, okay, definitely he's going to get his hand chopped off, right? No, because from the companion, and this is important. I'm going to get into this in a second. The companions of the Prophet, salam, in their application, like by Omar ibn al-Khattab during his caliphate and other companions of the Prophet who were acting as judges in the early Islamic period, we know that they would do this. They would say, um, 
are you sure you stole this? Hmm. Uh, like, did you think this was yours? Yes, I thought it was mine. Hmm. I don't have to give any evidence. I just say, yes, I thought it was mine. Hmm. No one's going to get their hand chopped off. I'm going to get punished again. I get, I get smacked a bunch of times with a reed. Hmm. I get, uh, you know, put in prison, whatever the different punishment, whatever has been determined according to Tazir punishment. Oh. In fact, in Islamic law, in theory and in practice, the only way to get your hand chopped off if you're if you steal something is if you say like I want my hand to be chopped off. Otherwise, it almost never happens. And this is not you know Jonathan Brown giving some rosy version of Islamic law or something. Go. This is you know you can find non-Muslim scholars writing about this, hmm. like Rude Peters in his book on Islamic criminal law. He, he says it's essentially impossible to get your hand chopped off unless you actually want that to happen. Hmm. So then people. This is a little bit of a detour, yeah. but people ask me, well, why does why? the Quran have this rule then? Yeah. For the same reason that, do you know, okay, we're, I, I love this. We're in Britain. Mm -hmm. I can use this example here. Okay. Yes. In Britain, in the year 1800, do you know how many death penalty offenses there were? I don't. Over 200 death penalty offenses. Things like stealing someone's so, you know, uh, shoe buckles, yeah. stealing firewood going to like someone's pond and taking fish out of their pond. Death penalty offenses. Okay, were people actually put to death for these? No. I would imagine no. No. Um, what happens? Here's a question. When was the Metropolitan Police Force? When was the first police force in, in, in England founded? See, you're going to, you know, better than I do. <laughs> I should stop asking you these questions. <laughs> you're just going to go, you know, they're going to, okay, so I'm, you know what? Actually, I know you know the answer to this, but yeah. you're you're playing along. That's good. You're playing along. You're letting Thank me. You very much. Yes. Okay, so 1830. Ah. By eight by the end of the, the 19th century, so by 1900. Yes. How many death penalty offenses are there in in Britain? Four. Wow. Really. Four. So you go from 200 to four in a century. What changes? Police force is founded. Railways. Um, modern bureaucracy, salaried, you know, administration, essentially modernization occurs. Huh. It's very common in pre-modern legal systems to have extremely severe punishments, hmm. but then not actually have those punishments carried out. Why? There's no police force. There's no, there's no, there's no like inspector who comes and says, I'm going to do it again. Well, 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 what have we here, right? There's nobody who comes, there's no one who's going to come to your house and investigate something. Yes. There's no guy walking around with like twirling his baton. Yes. Okay. There's no investigative policing. There's no preventative policing. And, and that's in the cities. Then forget about like going outside of the cities. There's nothing. Hmm. So the, the, what the law does is it, is it, it can only just strike fear into people's heart. Tell people this is really serious. Hmm. But then they don't actually want people getting their, getting killed for stealing firewood, right? Yeah. But the idea is you you kind of scare the population into this. And then because, and if someone actually gets caught, there's always, and this is the same thing in the British legal system in the, in the assizes, yeah. which is they would always find a way out for the um, the, 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 person, the suspect or the, yeah. the convict. Yes. So uh, the same thing in the Islamic legal tradition, because the prophet says, alayhi salatu salam, find a way out, ward off the hudud punishments from the believers mm. uh, as much as possible. If you find a way out for the person, mm. use it. It's better to err in mercy than to err in severity. So this is, um, everything I've told you is from the sunnah of the prophet, both in the form of hadith and in the form of the companion's uh, practice mm. and then the legal tradition after that. Yeah. So the sunnah explains the Quran, it adds to the Quran, it restricts the Quran. Right. Now, someone might say, I mean, you know, I'm Professor Brown, but like the Quran says, you know, it's tibyanun li kulli shay. The Quran says, this is a clarification of all things. Yes. The Quran says, uh, what is it? Ma faratna min al kitabi min shay, I think is the verse, I'm not mistaken. So we have not, God says, we have not omitted anything from this book. Yes. But, <laughs> Professor Brown, you just told me you just told me all this stuff that's not in the Quran. Yeah. So the Quran seems to be contradicting itself. The answer to this is, and this gets to your kind of original question, hmm. the Quran authorizes the Sunnah. So in that sense, is the Sunnah revelation from Allah? Subhanahu the Sunnah, the Sunnah is a type of revelation. Ah. So it depends, right? So if yeah. you say, 
you know, technically speaking, the Quran is kalam Allah. Mm -hmm. So the the wording and the the content, yes. the meaning and the wording mm -hmm. is divine. Mm -hmm. The sunnah, the meaning is inspired by God. The wording is prophetic, is mm -hmm. from a human being, right? But the Quran says, for example, that we sent down the kitab, al kitab wal hikmah, the mm -hmm. book and the wisdom. The Quran says, what is it? Wa anzalna ilayka dhikra li tubayna lil nasi manuzila alayhim, right? We sent down to you, Muhammad, the 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 remembrance, the 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 the, the kind of the, the saying that you might clarify to people what was revealed to them. So the Quran is saying, we gave you, Muhammad, wisdom, teaching, knowledge that with which you can clarify this message. Mm. So the Quran, it's as if I say, for example, to like, um, let's say I tell, you know, like my older kid, I say, hey, I tell the younger kid, I say, listen, I'm leaving, I'm going upstairs, whatever, I'm going to go listen to a podcast and clean the bathroom or something. I don't want to be disturbed. <laughs> you, you know, um, you listen to your older brother. Now, when that older brother tells him to do something, he's he's actually, and the younger kid listens to him, which in theory he's going to do, but actually not going to do, right? He's actually obeying me. So that his, I've deputized, I've sort of authorized the, the, the older kid. Right. So it's the same thing. Yes. So the sunnah is, now, it's interesting because there's a hadith in Sunnah of Abu Dawood, which is actually not a super reliable hadith, I don't think, but it's, mm. it's I think it, 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 it represents this idea pretty well. Which is that the Prophet says, uh, right? I was given the book and its likes with it. So I was given the book and the Sunnah along with it. And also, you see, Muslim scholars refer to the Prophet as Sahib al the the person, the kind of holder of two revelations the revelation of the Quran, the revelation of the Sunnah of the Prophet. Can I keep talking? Yes, you can, please. Okay, because I mean, I'm, I'm going to just... Well, I, I have got a question. Yeah. Um, we often, in, in common language, we often use the word sunnah yeah. to mean the prayer, the turaka after Maghrib, yeah. for example, uh, or the turaka before Fajr or, or something like this, right? Or So uh, we have got sunnah as a source of sharia, which you're describing, the hadith as a source of sharia. And then we've got sunnah as a... A rule of action or as a hukum shari'i, I, yeah. I suppose, right? Uh, are they, what's the connection between the two? This is, in a, in a way, this is just um, kind of coincidental, really? sin, sin, you know, what is it, uh, hom hom homophones or what is that, I care the word. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, it's uh, it's actually more helpful just not to use the word sunnah. So, right. so there's what's called the ahkam al taklifiyah, right. which are like the normative grades. Yes. So, Wajib required, yeah. um, sunnah or mandub, which is recommended, yes. uh, mubah, permissible, makruh, disliked, haram, forbidden, right? Yes. So in this, this is just a, for our cases, distraction, right? Really? Which is the people tend to say, and you often find Muslim scholars talking about something being sunnah or sunnah mu'akkada, like, yeah. you know, Hanifis, verified yeah. sunnah or... Yeah less verified sunnah, yeah. to things that are not required or maybe not epistemologically as strong as other types of rulings, yeah. but are have this name. But that's that's just a distraction. I mean, right. for our purposes, it's a distraction. So, it so just to clarify, you can, for example, get, so if we call it mandub, let's say, let's use that term, uh, an action that is mandub can actually come from Quran? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it can come from the Quran. It can come from... Uh, hadith, yeah. From qiyas, from you know, an analogical reasoning, it yeah. comes from lots of things. So, yeah. uh, in fact, that's kind of the in the Hanafi school what defines what's called sunnah mu'akkada uh -huh. or wajib as wajib. opposed to fard. Yeah, is the wajib and fard are both requirements. Yes, but it's where they come from and like the the kind of epistemological backing. Something that's Quranic is fard. Something yeah. that's from the sunnah is wajib. Right. Yeah. So on, on Baba, do the Hanafis then regard the wajib? I know it's a distraction from yeah. the original, but it just just for my understanding, do they regard the wajib to be of a lesser obligation to that of the fard? As far as I understand it, and I, you know, I'm talking to 
I'm in Britain and I probably have like five different Maulanas walking around outside who could <laughs> potentially answer this. But yes. as far as I understand it, and you can always like a little correction note in here yes. um, if you want, which is I think they're equally binding. They're equally yeah. normative. It's yeah. a question of what underlies that normativity in terms of the source. Yes. Um, okay. Now, yeah. you you said something which I think is an important point to move on to, which okay. is you said we have the sunnah, the hadith. So you, you're kind of treating them as synonymous. Yes. But they're not synonymous. Uh -huh. Okay. They're not synonymous. Yeah. It's very important. They're very different things. Hadith are a way of knowing about the sunnah. Okay. Remember, the Sunnah is the normative precedent of the Prophet Muhammad, right. Salam, right? The Sunnah is the lens through which we read and understand the Quran. Hmm. Okay. One way to know about the Sunnah is reports about things the Prophet said, things he did, and things that were done in his presence to which he did not object. That's Hadith. That's one way to know about okay. it. Okay. That's not the only way to know about it. There are, this is my own breakdown. I, I, it's, I think it's totally correct, but it's not, I'm not, you know, channeling some earlier Muslims. There's Jonathan Brown's list, okay? You can uh, call it as such. There's, you can think of like four different ways of knowing what the Sunnah of the Prophet is. Okay. So the first one is Hadiths. Right. Now, each of these ways is legitimate. In fact, every school of law, every school of theology in Islamic tradition hmm. uses all of these four. Mm -hmm. One of the ways, one of the reasons you see, let's say, the Maliki school differ from the Hanabi school is because of which one they emphasize more or which one they lean on in a particular circumstance versus another source. Hmm. They're all legitimate. They're all used by every school of law and theology. Each of these ways of knowing about the Sunnah has its strengths and each has its drawbacks. Hmm. So one way is hadiths. Okay, I want to know what the Sunnah of the Prophet was. So I go and I collect hmm. as many reports as I can. Hmm. And let's assume they're all authentic, right? Yes. But now what do I have to do? I have to figure out how they relate to one another. Um, what if he says, for example, you find an authentic hadith where the Prophet said, where Muslims say that um, we used to, during the time of the Prophet, do wudu after we ate cooked food. Do you ever do wudu after you eat cooked food? No. Okay, you don't. But this is this is a sound hadith. Why right. aren't you Why aren't you following the sunnah of the prophet? Because it's then explained that then the prophet changed this yeah. and would eat food, cooked food, and not do wudu. So we knew that we didn't have to do this anymore. Mm. So that's what's called nasr or abrogation. So this hadith is mansukh. It's abrogated. Right. But you have to figure out, okay, here's this hadith, here's this hadith, and you have to put them together, figure out. Sometimes... The Prophet will say, Alayhi Salaam, like, I used to tell you to do this, but now do this. Okay, yes. that's easy. Okay. Okay. Then sometimes you might have something that the Prophet says that's general for everybody, yeah. or maybe it's specific for a certain person. Uh -huh. You have to figure out how these relate to one another. Hmm. Uh, the Prophet, Alayhi Salaam, oftentimes, like any you know, leader of a big community or a politician, he doesn't go out and speak like a lawyer. He doesesn't say, you know, uh, uh, regarding point uh, 3A, uh, stipulating, you know, everyone would fall asleep. Hmm. He goes out and he's, you know, speaking these kind of in a hyperbolic language, a grand language, especially pre-Islamic Arabia is a, is a culture of hyperbole. Yes. You know, like these pre-Islamic poets, they're not saying like, I'm pretty generous. I'm decently generous. Hmm. Like, I'm the most generous person. I slaughtered all the camels of my tribe to... To feed the guests who came, you know, it's, yes. even today, one could argue that Arab culture is a little bit hyperbolic, yes. you know? Yeah. Uh, you go to like Arab person's house, they don't say like, please eat. You know, no, I think you should eat some food. They say like, no, no, you can't. no, I will not accept you leaving without eating all the food. Okay. I'm married to Arab, by the way, so That's just right. to make it clear. Yes. So, um, sometimes you have hadiths. For example, like the Prophet will, um, uh, will say, قَاتِلَ اللَّهِ يَهُودِ حُرِّمَ عَلَيْهِمْ الشَّحُومِ فَأَذَابُهَا وَأَكِلُوا الثَّمَنِ Right? So, a Sahih Hadith where the Prophet says, you know, may God fight the Jews. They were, it was prohibited them to eat the um, fat of animals, certain animals, but then they melted the fat to, to oil and they sold the oil, and then they took the money, right? So he's he's being critical of this like legal ruse. Mm. Right? Now I'm gonna say, oh my God, like look at this, you know, like 
fuck God, may God fight the Jews. Like, oh, you know, I knew it. I knew the Muslims had this problem. But you have to understand how Arabic language, you know, this phrase, and this, this is not Jonathan Brown trying to do some like kinder, gentler version of Islam. This yeah. is pre-modern Muslim scholars all, all right about this. They say, what does, may God fight somebody? This is just, uh, this is, um, uh, I disapprove of this. It's like, this is something I disapprove of, right? Hmm. He's not punishing anybody for doing this. You know, hmm. he's just saying, this is, I disapprove of this. Yeah. So they have to take the, la the, the language and the culture of how people speak at the time into consideration, right. fitting all these things together. Yeah. So the strength of this approach of using hadiths to know the son of the prophet, Lay Salaam, is that you have a lot of details. It's a really yeah. fine-grained picture. Uh -huh. But the, 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 the challenge is how do you have to fit, how do you fit these puzzle pieces together? Yes. Why do you have different schools of law and theology in Islam? Sometimes because they fit the pieces together differently. The second way of knowing the son of the prophet is legal interpretation. Uh -huh. Right? So Muslims, got, like the companions of the prophet, the companions of the prophet, yeah. they, especially the senior ones, for example, there's very few hadiths narrated from like Omar mm. compared to other, or, or like Ali or Uthman. There's not many hadiths from them. Mm. Most of the hadiths come from younger companions, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Omar, Anas bin Malik, Aisha, um, Abu Huraira, people who knew the Prophet only for a relatively limited time. Right. For them, they're going around and collecting all these reports from other companions. They want to hear, you, for example, you very rarely hear Abu Huraira say, I heard the Prophet say. He says the Prophet said something. Mm. He, he's getting it from another companion. Right. Right. He's going and collecting this from other people and writing down in notebooks as material. Mm. Um, the senior companions don't quote the, the Prophet very much. Alayhi salam. Because they, the sunnah for them is something that was like imprinted on their personalities. Right. It's like when you, uh, let's say you're like a, a doctor or something, right? Mm -hmm. So you apprentice with another doctor and you might not remember things this doctor said, but like you're, you kind of follow them around and, and they just sort of, you kind of model yourself after them and they, their, their way of doing things sort of imprints itself on you and sure. your conduct. That's the way the senior companions preserve the sunnah. And then they teach their senior students, and they teach their senior students, and they teach all the way up to the present day. Mm. So the Sunnah of the Prophet is a way of thinking, a way of, of problem solving. Mm. So you see this as a, a very important way of preserving the Sunnah. Yes. What's the strength? You know, you really get like kind of a spirit of the law. How do you deal with things in new situations when you come across people wearing pants, for example, instead of thobes or robes? Mm. What's the drawback? Sometimes you, you know, the spirit of the law can lead you away from the letter of the law and you start to kind of uh, maybe get too far out in your reasoning. The third way of knowing the Sunnah of the Prophet, very important, practice of a pious community. Okay. How do, the, how do Muslims act? So, you know, you probably learned to pray. You didn't learn to pray by reading hadiths. You probably learned to pray from your parents and by mm -hmm. going to the mosque and you see how other people pray. You know, how do you know how to act in a mosque? You know, how do you know that you know, you're not supposed to walk right in front of somebody. Like, I, and I, when I became Muslim, no one ever told me, like, don't walk in front of somebody when you're praying. You just sort of see people doing this, and you kind of absorb this just from communal practice. Yeah. It's a very important way of preserving the sunnah of the Prophet. Yeah. Finally, the last way is, you know, clear maxims and, and rules, like uh, the Prophet saying, uh, So the person making a claim has to provide evidence. Mm. The person whose the claim is made upon, if the person making the claim doesn't have any evidence, the person whose the claim is being made on just says, I swear I didn't do this or whatever. So if I say, for example, you broke my stereo, mm. you broke my car, right? I'm, I'm, you owe me money or something. I have to, you, I can't just say, I have to provide evidence. Mm. If, if I don't provide evidence, you're, you're innocent. So you could think of this as like innocent until proven guilty, right? Or sure. not liable until proven liable. Yes. So this is a, you know, it happens to be a hadith. But this is a very clear maxim that ends up governing lots of Islamic law. So these are four ways of knowing the sunnah. Yeah. They're all valid. They're all important. Uh, different schools would draw on them in, in different ways. So let's uh, talk about the hadith collections. I mean, commonly we know that in uh, Sunni tradition, there are six books of uh, hadith collections. Uh, Imam Bukhari was um, alive some 200 years after the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, uh, and so in between the, 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 the first 200 years, did we have any scholars that um, 
did equal work that der- that put together collections of hadith like these uh, imams of the six books or was that the first attempt to build these collections and i suppose my secondary question is why why did why did imam bukhari or muslim or abu dawood see it necessary to to compile hadith and to verify hadith into these collections of sahih uh, collections of books Okay, so a lot of uh, questions Many there. Many questions, yes. Um, okay, so the first thing to remember is uh, the it's very hard to... So there's no written tradition in like Western Northern Arabia. Right. Uh, there are alphabets. There's an alphabet in Yemen. They write temple inscriptions in ancient South Arabian languages, stuff yes. like that. Uh, but there's no like, you know... There's there's no you know Herodotus's history being written in Yemen or in the Hejaz like they the even the, the what becomes the Arabic alphabet is actually kind of developed and finalized to write the Quran so there's not even really a complete alphabet really the people don't write stuff down or they very write very simplistic stuff down right. like shopping lists yeah you know or like you know I I have a you know I'm giving you five bags of grain you're giving me three bags of dates you know and write, write this down and very simple write yeah. there's no written tradition or literary tradition so like the as i said the, the writing the quran is like this i mean unprecedented act in northern and western arabia mm. it's like this something that muslims develop an alphabet to do uh, one of the reasons they didn't write down stuff is that there's not very easy writing material. I mean, now we have paper, right. okay? It's cheap, it's easy. But I mean, paper didn't enter the Muslim world until seven, like the, around 790, the Common Era, from mm-hmm. China. So before that, or in the Roman world, like remember, Romans don't write stuff down either. For daily stuff, they write on wax tablets. Mm-hmm. And they write all the stuff they put in stone. I mean, that's not they're not going to you know, chip stuff into stone easily. Mm-hmm. They, there's papyrus. Papyrus is very expensive. It's only grown in Egypt. Right. Uh, there is parchment, which is treated animal skin. This is developed in uh, Bergama in in what's today Turkey mm. uh, as an att- as an alternative to papyrus. It's also very expensive. I mean, you know, how many animal skins are you going to buy? Mm. So this is a very expensive material. You can't just sort of write down random stuff on it. Um, so there are some the there are companions of the Prophet who know how to write. Most of these are uh, e- were either previously Jews in Medina, mm-hmm. or they were polytheist Arabs like Zaydib and Thabit, who were raised by Jewish, who, who went into the Jewish schools in Medina. Right. So he knows how to write Hebrew, he knows how to write Aramaic, mm-hmm. he knows how to write this early Arabic. Uh, so what they're writing stuff down on, whether it, it's a Quranic verses or early uh just collections of things they hear the prophet say, yeah. they're writing on, I mean, really simplistic stuff. They're writing on pottery pieces. They're writing on camel shoulder bones. They're writing on uh, the palm uh, scratching onto like sticks, the outside of sticks, parchment. It's very expensive, okay? Right. Very uh, cumbersome. So in the, some of the companions of the prophet like Abu Huraira, like Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, start to collect some of these early written sources about hadiths. Mm. We're not talking about the Quran anymore. We're just talking about writing down hadiths. Right. And these are uh, put down in the things that are called sahifa. Sahifa basically means page, pages, a page. Right. And uh, this might be papyrus, it might be parchment, it might be like um, scratched into, I don't know if you see like palm trees mm. and if they're not manicured, they, they kind of grow these like sheaths that come out of them that are really fibrous and thin. Okay. You rip them off and you can cut them into, into like sections and you can scratch stuff into it, right? right. So that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's very cum- cumbersome. Now, what you see is these are called sahifas and they're passed down usually from uh, in, a, in a family. Mm-hmm. So the Sahifa of Amr bin Shu'ayb, for example, comes from his great his grandfather, from his grandfather, from Abdullah ibn Amr bin al-As, mm-hmm. the companion of the Prophet, the son of Amr bin al-As. Yeah. So, uh, or the um, 
There are other sahifas as well that are famous. Wahab ibn Munab, uh, sorry, Hammam ibn Munabbih, who died in 732 common era, gets one from, writes down a bunch of hadiths from Abu Huraira. That's uh, a famous sahifa. Mm -hmm. Now, these are passed on in the families, and then they're copied by students who want to, to get this material. Because, so now we've gone from like the companions of the Prophet, the last companion of the Prophet, the last major one who dies is uh, Anas ibn Malik, who mm -hmm. dies in 93 Hijri in Basra. So 93 Hijri is like, I don't know, one seven seven thirteen. I'm just guessing, hmm. right around that time. Um, the successors among the successors, there are people like Zuhri, Said bin Abi Uruba, who start to they're collecting hadith orally because you know that's how people are transmitting a lot of this stuff. It's just you know, for example, if I ask you, you know, did you did you go to that talk by Jonathan Brown? Did he say anything interesting in the talk? Yeah, he said you know. Uh, somebody said he looked like Harrison Ford today, which actually happened. Really? And the person was not homeless asking for money. It was actually an intelligent person. So I was okay. really complicated. Although they didn't say what age Harrison Ford they're talking yes. about. So it might be like very old Harrison yes. Ford. Anyway, yeah. so the point is, so you could say that. I mean, you're not going to like write this down. Yeah. But if, if suddenly everyone becomes obsessed with Jonathan Brown and what he says, you could say, I remember one time Jonathan Brown said this. Yeah. And someone writes that down. Uh -huh. um, even though this for you was oral. So then, uh, in the time of the, the kind of the early 700s, the, the younger people who met the companions of the prophet, they start to write down, uh, collect and write down this material, gather existing written material into mm -hmm. notebooks. Sometimes these are papyrus sc scrolls or parchment. And then the next generation, the generation, so I mentioned a scholar, Muhammad ibn Shahab al-Zuhri, mm -hmm. died in uh, 748 of the Common Era. His, no, 742 of the Common Era. I'm sorry, 742. Right. So his student, one of his students, is Malik ibn Anas, mm. big scholar in Medina. So Malik ibn Anas meets people who are successors to the companions of the Prophet. So that he meets people from the second generation of the Muslims, a lot of people from the third generation, Yes. all the great scholars of Medina. Mm. And he's starting to also write down, what are they saying? What are the hadiths they're transmitting? What are the, the rulings of Omar bin al-Khattab? What are the rulings of Aisha? What are the rulings of Ibn Abbas? Mm. Writing all this stuff down and then starting to organize it. And now you have the first like actual book, an example. I mean, th in the time of Malik, so the mid to late 700s, right. books like the Muatta of Malik, books like the Muatta of, uh, not same title, it means the well-trodden path of Ibn Majushun, mm. right? Ibn Abi Dib or something. And, uh, or the Jamia of Ma'ma bin Rashid, who died at 153 Hijri. So, and we, there's actually a manuscript, partial manuscript in, I think it's in Spain, dated in 974 of the Common Era. So it's, that was when that copy was written of the collection. Jamia means like just collection of Ma'ma bin Rashid, who comes from Basra originally. He goes to uh, Yemen, settles mm -hmm. in Yemen. So his compilation that was transmitted from him by his student, Abdul Razak Sanani. Hmm. Abdul Razak Sanani from Sana'a uh, died in 211 Hijri, about, um, I'm just going to say 817, 820 or the common era. Eight, 820, maybe, I can't remember exactly. Right. The common era. So... Malik's generation, kind of the mid 700s, you have people either just collecting everything they've heard in terms of hadiths, companion rulings, mm -hmm. what big successor scholars are saying, just putting it all together. Mm -hmm. Malik ibn Anas in his Muatta is actually trying to, okay, here's the material on prayer. Here's the material on fasting. Here's the material on zakat. Here's the material on buying and selling things. Here's the material on inheritance. Here's the material on divorce. And then specific sub questions. What do you do when you make a mistake in prayer? Uh, what can you buy and sell? What are the, the types of sales you're not allowed to do? Mm. And he'll put the, what are the Quranic verses? What are the hadiths that I you know? What are the companion rulings? Let me try and figure this out. What is the ruling I come out with? So th those are some of the earliest books. Those books contain hadiths, but they're not hadith books. Right. They're like transcripts of all the, the kind of normative material these scholars are bringing together to try and answer questions. Right. The next generation, 
This is Imam Bukhari's generation. No. No. Uh-huh. Now Malik ibn Anas dies 179 Hijri, mm-hmm. 795 of the Common Era. Mm. Malik just lives in Medina. He yes. doesn't he doesn't go anywhere. He goes to Hajj. Yeah. Abu Hanifa and Kufa lives in Kufa. Mm-hmm. He goes to Hajj. That's it, right? So they don't But remember, if you're a um let's say you're uh where do your ancestors come from? India. Okay. So let's say your ancestors come from um originally let's say they come from Sindh. Let's mm-hmm. just pretend, okay? Yes. They're hanging out in Sindh. One day, these Arab guys show up, which happened, right? 7-Eleven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, year 7-Eleven, they show up. They say, hey, we're Muslims. Hmm. You guys are pretty cool. I like your clothing. You seem to know what's going on. I, I want to become Muslim. Hmm. What is Islam? They don't say, hey, go to the bookstore, get a book on Islam. They don't say go to internet, the internet. You know, look. Islam is what they know it is. If, if they happen to remember certain hadiths of the Prophet, if they happen to know certain ruling, if like certain companions settled in northeastern Iran, right? The companions who went into Iran, who went into Iraq, they're the ones, it's their understanding of Islam that they're bringing. So the companions who settle in Syria are different than the companions who settle in Basra, or different from the companions who settle in Kufa, different from the companions who settle in Yemen, right? Or in Egypt. Mm. Each of them has their own recollections of the prophet's tradition, of the prophet's words, of his deeds. They're, they're each applying this tradition of problem solving in different ways. So what you end up with is by the like kind of mid 700s to late 700s, very localized pockets of Islamic knowledge. Yeah. Kufa is very different from Basra. They're very different from Damascus, very different from Medina. It's the tr- tradition, uh, the generation after Malik. So people were living in the late 700s, early 800s. Imam Shafi is a good example. Okay. Who start traveling around between all these places. And they're not only are they re- they they're, they're collecting hadiths from all these places, so they're getting the hadiths from Basra, the hadiths from Kufa, the hadiths from Khorasan, the hadiths from Egypt. Hmm. What else? I'll, this is a, I'm going to test you. I mentioned a date earlier, something that happened in 790, around 790, something very important involving technology. Um, is it a development of a new an alternative to paper? Paper. Right? Yes. Right? Oh, from China. Exactly. Right. Yes. So now suddenly you can, you're not like, God, you don't have this like expensive scroll. Man, you know, like sometimes you have like a one piece of paper and you just write like every tiny little corner. Yeah. You're not scrolling like every single thing you can fit onto a piece of papyrus that's right. really expensive or parchment. You can just buy cheap paper and you can write down as much stuff as you want. Oh, yeah. So suddenly people can write, let's say I hear the same hadith from five different teachers. Instead of just writing it down, from one teacher, I can write down all five chains of transmission. Uh-huh. No big deal. Yeah. So the next generation, the people in living in the early 800s, late 700s, early 800s, start writing what's called musnads. Musnad is a hadith, is a collection of hadith, hmm. really just focusing on the, the words of the prophet. No companion opinions. No successor opinions. No no my opinion. Right. Um, with full chains of transmission back to the prophet. Um, but these aren't organized topically. Right. So remember the books like the Muatta, I said, he's, he's writing, here's the chapter on prayer, sub chapter on like what time you do the prayers, when do you do the Dhuhr prayer, when do you do the Asr prayer? Hmm. Musnad is arranged by the Isnad. This is completely useless. If you want, let's say you go and you pick up a Musnad, you're like, I want to know, you know, what time I should pray. Yes. You, you it could be anywhere in this yeah, book. Yeah. Yeah. But let's say I want to know all the hadiths narrated by Ibn Abbas. Oh, that's very easy. Yes. Why would someone organize a book like this? Because this is all to the time, late 700s, where you have the emergence really of science of what becomes hadith criticism Mm -hmm. based on the isnad, how it's organized. So these are books for people who are now like professional hadith scholars, late 700s. Yes. A couple decades later. Um, the earliest Musnad, by the way, we know of is by a, a, a Basran scholar named Abu Dawood at Tayalasi, who and died. How many hadith were there? Ah, uh, oh, geez. You know, I should know the answer to this. Not that many. Hmm. I'm thinking maybe a couple of thousand. Yeah. Uh, he died at 204 Hijri 820 right. of the Common Era. Right. His Musnad's actually survived. It's really? published, right? Yeah. So we have it. Really, um, I think it's 
couple of volumes. It's not very big. Okay. Now, um, this is great. The most, by the way, the most famous Musnad would be the Musnad of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, mm. who died in uh, 241 Hijri, 855 of the Common Era. Right. And he, he, this is about uh, 27,000 hadiths. Right. And anywhere from one fourth to one third of these are repetitions. Right. So it's very common to find, let's say, in the Musnad of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten versions of the same hadith. Okay. Uh, now, next generation. Hmm. This is almost in generations, like literally, like the students of people. So, right. Ibn Hanbal's students are saying, "Okay, this is interesting," but um, this, these Muslims are not useful. Hmm. So, what they do is they take those topically arranged, that topically arranged book idea, and the idea of books that are just focused on hadiths with full snads back to the Prophet. And they put them together. And that's what's called Sunan books. Sunan. So the first Sunan book we know is by a guy named Saeed bin Mansur. Uh -huh. He died, I think, in 227 Hijri, about like you now 840 of the Common Era. That book has survived in part. Mm. And then a couple of other really famous ones. A guy named Tirmidhi, Abu Daud, Ibn Majah, and Nasa'i. We know these, they are authors of the so four of the famous six books. Yes. Again, they have books that are based on topic, but also with full isnaz back to the prophet. Mm. Now, and it's funny because sometimes you'll like go to the mosque and it'll be like uh, something on the bathroom, you know, don't do not do something in the bathroom and it'll be like hadith from Sunan of Ibn Majah, yes. hadith from Sunan of Tirmidhi. Those books have lots of unreliable hadith in them. Really? For example, Tirmidhi's book, he says, Lots of times, this hadith is weak. Why is it in his book? Yeah, Because his book is not, it's not, I'm going to tell you the sunnah of the prophet. His book is, I'm going to give you what are the different hadiths that are used in debates on these legal issues. Yes. So some of them will be things that his, he thinks are actually not reliable that are used by his opponents, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. So this hadith is it's not reliable. It's weak chain of transmission. Right. So you have to be careful when you look at these books, it's not like this is all reliable according to those authors. Sunan of Ibn Majah has, according to scholars like a Dhahabi, famous Damas Damas Damascus scholar who died in 1348 of the Common Era, he says like a quarter of Ibn Majah's book is unreliable. Really? Um, so you have to be careful, but why is it, why would, let's say, why would Ibn Majah have hadith that's unreliable? Mm -hmm. He's not doing this like you know, these are all the hadiths that are being used in debates. Yeah. Because Ibn Majus, you know, his approach is more, look, I have like two really strong hadiths. Maybe one says like ABC. Hmm. The other one says CBD. So I know ABC is strong from the Prophet. I know CBD is strong from the Prophet. But look, I have this other version. It's not very strong. It's not, but it says A, B, C, D. So put this in. We know the material is reliable, but now you have like one very handy version, right? Mm -hmm. So the content might be reliable, but that actual hadith is not. So you, each of these... Now, two scholars from that period, mm -hmm. one of them from Bukhara, and then his student from Nishapur in Iran, northeastern Iran, they have a different... Approach. They say, look, and one of them, Muslim, then Hajjaj and Isapur, he dies uh, 268, 75 of the Common Era. Yeah. He says, look, we have this science of hadith criticism we've, we've developed. Why are we, you know, why are we doing this thing where we put like, an unreliable version of something? And, you know, I don't care if it's useful. Mm. This is not, we're not sure the Prophet said this. Mm. We can't put it in here. Our whole, the whole purpose of our science of hadith Criticism yeah. is to preserve the words of the prophet of God. So that's what our job is. So he says, this book is just hadiths with sound change of transmission back to the prophet. Mm. His teacher, Bukhari, did the same thing in his Sahih, mm. which is even bigger than Muslim Sahih. Um, and so these two are like, they stand out in that they only have hadiths that, according to the Sunni science of hadith criticism, can be 
accurately traced. The actual, that actual wording can be traced back to the prophet of God reliably according to Sunni scholars. So um, why did... Um, so uh, there is an argument by some Orientalists that I, I picked up. Um, uh, Godzai Heron Shacht, I'm sure I'm mm -hmm. not pronouncing their names right, but they argued that the scholarship that came out of the second and third century reflected the cultural, political and sectarian order of the time. Um, and so uh, these scholars who were compiling the Hadith were prejudiced because in some in some senses they were appealing to the rulers. Um, and so they may have omitted some um, some Hadith. Um, these, these scholars are getting tortured. I mean, I, that's kind of, I mean, I understand yeah. your point, but yeah. like that, even, even Hambal is like literally gets tortured right. by the Abbasid government yes. for not having a certain political opinion or a certain yeah. theological opinion. Yeah. Bukhari dies literally on the road in exile. Right. After he's gotten kicked out of two different cities. Really? In one city by the ruler, you know? So, uh, I mean, I guess everybody is affected by their context, but yes. definitely they're not trying to please any politicians right. or rulers. Now, um, okay, so what uh, Goldzeher and Schacht and general kind of Western scholarship argues is that um, these... Okay, first of all, we have to understand the background of this, right? So uh, what happens, and if you're interested in this, you can read a whole chapter on this in my book on Hadith, but right. what happens, let's just put it roughly, from the 1300s to the 1800s, mm. is that uh, scholars in Western Europe, Christian scholars in Western Europe, uh, gradually figure out that a lot of stuff they thought was true about, the, let's say, the classical tradition and the biblical tradition is not actually true, right? So there wasn't actually some guy named Homer who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, okay? Uh, the Bible wasn't, the first five books of the Bible were not written down by Moses, right? Um, there is not just four gospels telling the story of Jesus. There's a lot of other gospels. Uh, the, this text, These texts went through changes, stuff got added to them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Christian doctrine didn't just, come out of like Jesus didn't come out and say it, you know here's a list of christian doctrine that everyone agrees on and mm -hmm. and then that was like handed down generally you know the church developed and shaped doctrine this developed over the centuries for mm -hmm. various political and social and cultural reasons etc cetera, etc cetera, yes right so what they think is okay religion changes over time scripture is never authentic right scripture is always being altered or invented or something like that uh and what religions are is basically what they're shaped to be by later generations. Right. So they just assume this is true for everybody. Really? I mean, and they, they literally say this, like they say, we're going to go to India and we're going to like bring the light of our scholarship to them and teach them, you know, what their tradition, we're going to go study their scripture. We're going to figure out what the actual like Vedas are and what the Upanishads are and what the original form of Hinduism was and how it changed over time. Then we're going to tell people this, they're going to be enlightened. Right? Hmm. So, uh, they have just assumptions about how human beings work, which they think apply to everybody in the world at right. all times. So one of those assumptions is that, certainly from Islam, is that it's not a true religion, right? So they think, you know, maybe this Muhammad guy was like pretty, maybe he was like, you know, he was a good leader. He was like, you know, impressive guy. But he, he definitely wasn't a prophet. He's some, maybe he's crazy. Maybe he's just like Machiavelli and has some, he's some community building project or something. Hmm. But he's definitely not a prophet, right? So in that case, you know, anytime we see him saying, for example, there will come a time when X thing will happen. Like there will come a time, you know, the, you will see black banners coming from the East. Uh, so join this army because this is the army of the, the rightly guided one, right? They'll say, oh, well, this is obviously made up, right? And you can see, look, uh, the Abbasid caliphs, when they do their revolution in the late 740s, early 750s of the mm -hmm. common era, mm -hmm. what color are their clothing? Black. What color are their flags? Black, right? So this is probably made up by the Abbasids. So they're like, uh, hey, they say, hey, guys, like, uh, we need to get some, you know, they're like, a, 
like some po politician yes. getting, you know, like the do the Dominic Cummings of the day or whatever to go and, you know, <laughs> get some material out there. You know, yes. we want some like some good PR. Yes. So they get these guys to go and like forge these hadiths. Um, and by the way, Muslim scholars very quickly understood there was a huge problem of forged hadiths. Uh -huh. So this, like, in the as you get from the time of the companions into the time of successors. Yes. Remember, the Muslim community in the first 150 years goes through three civil wars, huge wars, okay, internally. Hmm. It expands from, like, Western, basically Arabia to Morocco to India and Central Asia, okay? And so not only do you have three civil wars that are over, like, theological, political issues. Yes. You've got all these Christians, you've got Jews, you've got Zoroastrians, you've got Buddhists, you've got Aramaic speakers, you've got Greek speakers, you've got New you know, Coptic speakers, you've got everything. All these people are now under your control and they're becoming Muslim. And they're all like, hey, I have an idea. Like I have, my culture is kind of interesting. Well, what about this? And everyone's, first of all, they're forging hadiths. Yeah. Second of all, they're just getting confused. They get confused about, is this something the prophet said or is this something that someone else said? And so it's up. There's intentional forgery, there's accidental confusion. And this is, Muslim scholars are inundated by this. Right. So very quickly they realize this is a serious issue. And they start trying to figure out ways to sort out what's the authentic words of the prophet from uh, mistakes or forgeries. And how did they do that? Okay. Well, first let me just, uh, I want to, uh, we'll talk about that in a second, but let yeah. me finish the example of the kind of Orientalist approach, right? Oh, yes. So this is just an example of, um, Kind of how Western assumptions about history can blind Western scholars to other possibilities, right? So they assume that if you see a hadith that says black banners are going to come from the east, join them because there's the, the army, the rightly guided one. Yeah. They say, oh, this was made up by the Abbasids. Mm. Okay, here's the thing. Um, in the in the 16, I think it's the 1640s, this early, like one of the founders of the Quaker movement, a guy named John Naylor, mm. he goes, he and he goes to Bristol, I think Bristol, and he does so riding on a donkey. And his followers are like singing like Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna for him. Okay. Why is he doing this? Okay. Jesus in the New Testament enters Jerusalem riding on a donkey with people putting like palm fronds in front of him and they're saying like, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. In the Old Testament, there's prophecies about this, your, your Messiah will come to Jerusalem riding on a donkey, people putting palm fronds in front of him and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hmm. Okay, so what happens? According to like the Orientalist view of the world, John Naylor's, people like these early Quakers are like, we got to get some good material out there. Okay. So they, they would go back, insert this story in the new Testament about Jesus, insert the story in the old Testament, and then to match what he's doing. Of course, that's ridiculous because yes. the new Testament has already been around for thousands of years. Similarly, they would say Jesus, Jesus's followers were like, we got to get some good material out there. So they put this in the old Testament. Or how about this? There's an Old Testament prophecy about someone entering Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, putting, people putting palm fronds in front of them, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Then Jesus, in the biblical tradition, I'm not talking about Islamic Jesus, right? Yes. Biblical tradition walks, acts out that prophecy. John Naylor in the 1600s acts out that prophecy, right? So which came first, chicken or the egg, right? Is it that the... Abbasids had this material circulated, mm. or is it that there is a hadith that exists about this something happening? And then they, Taylor, I mean, they didn't have to pick black. Why did they pick? Were they like early goths or something? You know, they pick black They uh, for their banner colors in part to actually act out this scripture, right. this prophecy. Yes. So it's the perspective one has, and your assumptions really color what your conclusions are. Hmm. Uh, so that's uh, what, what they, so this is an, an important, um, I think, critique of the Western scholarly tradition. Yes. Okay. Um, now, 
of, as I mentioned before, Muslim scholars, Sunni Hadith scholars, will happily admit and always admitted there's an enormous amount of forged Hadiths. Right. One famous scholar, one of the most famous scholars of Hadith ever, a guy named Shu'ba ibn al-Hajjaj, hmm. who died around 773, he's from Basra. He said, three-fourths of the Hadiths I've come across are forged. Right. Three-quarters. This is a huge problem. That, that's why they developed these methods of Hadith criticism. Right. Okay? Now, you might say, um, you know, okay, but... Uh, you know, I was reading Sunan of Abu Dawood and there was a hadith in there that seemed really... For example, there's a hadith in Sunan of Abu Dawood. Abu Dawood of Sijistan, he died 275 Hijri, 889 of the common era. Big scholar from Basra, student of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, hmm. important scholar. Uh, in his Sunan, he says, he writes a letter to the people of Mecca. He says about his Sunan, this book, if you have the Quran in my book, this is all you need. Right. This is what you need to understand your religion. Mm -hmm. So he feels his sunnah is his sunan book is really an accurate reflection of the sunnah of the Prophet. Yes. But there's a hadith in Sunnah of, sunnah of Abu Dawood. It says, you know, let nobody travel by ocean except if they're doing Hajj or Umrah or fighting in the path of God. Underneath the ocean is a fire. Underneath the fire is another ocean. And you might, let's say you're a geologist. You're like, oh, this doesn't make any sense. What do you mean underneath the fire is another, underneath the ocean is a fire, underneath the fire is another ocean? What? Yes. This hadith, that certainly that part of the hadith, Muslim scholars like a great scholar from the 1400s, Ibn al mulaqin he said from Cairo, he says, tafaka ala imma ala da'fihi. The imams agreed on the weakness of this. This is unreliable. Right. So why did he put it into his book? Good question. Yeah. We don't know. I mean, we don't know the answer to that. Like right. in this, sometimes Abu Dawood has a hadith in his book. And he points out there's a flaw in this chain of transmission. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he thinks that it's backed up enough by communal practice, or maybe it's not like a really important issue. Um, that's why he has it in here. But we don't know why that's in there. But yeah. we do know that Muslim scholars, like they're they're always engaged in self-criticism. They'll right. say, look, this is we found him, this is unreliable. Right. Another reason, by the way, you say, why did he put it in there? Hmm. One of the things we know about Sunni Hadith scholarship. We know this because they say it, they tell us this explicitly. As far back as we can trace Sunni Hadith scholarship, we have this principle. They say, if we come across Hadiths that deal with like halal and haram, that deal with ahkam, like prayer, fasting, buying and selling, yeah. marriage, divorce law, stuff like that, we're very strict about the change of transmission. We're very strict in our criticism. If we come about around, across stuff about manners, you know, what if you do this deed, you're going to get this reward in the afterlife, mm. like doing a dua. They say, we're lax. Right. We are lax in our criticism of the change of transmission. Uh -huh. why, would they, why would they say this? For them, this is, these are the second things are not core issues of the religion. Right. There's stuff you already know. For example, in... Uh, Let's say, Allahumma say to Muhammad. Um, you know, uh, let's say in in Sunnah of Abu. Uh, let's look at the example. Okay, uh, here's a here's a here's a good example. Right. It's going to be a little bit uh, a little bit vulgar. I'm. It's not my fault. I'm ready. Okay. Yes. You see this in let's, the Sunnah of Ibn Majah. The Prophet says, there's, let's say, there's 72 types of riba. The least severe type is the equivalent of having sex with your mother. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The least severe type is the equivalent of having sex with your mother. Mm -hmm. I have a question. When I told you that, were you like, whoa? I've heard it before, but when I first heard it, I was, yes. Yeah, you're like, whoa. And I, yeah. I was in the I, Juma once, and yes. I was like, Whoa, like I had yes. like a checking account or something. I don't know, yeah. I get like 2% interest a year. I was like, oh, um, maybe I should not do this. Yes. So this hadith is unreliable. Mm. It's why it's it's criticized by so many Muslim scholars, okay. pre-modern Muslim scholars, way before like, you know, modernity and right. Britain and America and all this stuff. Mm. One of the things they criticize, first of all, the change of transmissions are all, unreli all, are all unreliable. The second thing is, 
like Ibn al Jawzi, famous scholar from Baghdad, died in 1200 of the Common Era. He says, This hadith, Yufsidu Mawazin Maqadir al Amal. It ruined, it's, it destroys your capacity for like balancing moral acts. Hmm. Like if you think that getting 1%, you know, one penny of interest on a million dollars is the same as having Zen, like doing something that every society in the world thinks is disgusting, hmm. like you're not going to be able to do moral calculation. You're not going to be able to like, ba you know, weigh moral actions. You're going to be, the, you're going to kind of be morally disabled in a way. This is what his criticism. Yes. Very, that's a, I think that's a very good criticism. But why would this book, why would this hadith be in there? Hmm. Remember what the Scott, what they said, their principle. If it's something to do with like the virtues or punishment, the, the, you do this act, you're going to get this punishment. You do this act, you're going to get this reward. They say we're lax when the isnads. Hmm. We already know riba is haram. We yes. know riba is haram from the Quran. Yes. We know riba is haram from the hadith. That's already established. This hadith isn't adding anything new. For that, for Ibn Majah, what it's doing is it's scaring your pants off. Like, y this is really going to make you not do riba. We know you're not supposed to do it. This is going to be in a, I think, mean, maybe the prophet said it. Hmm. Maybe like 20% he said it. Yes. It's useful. Right. That's what Muslim is objecting to. One of the things that's, I think, chiefly what Muslim and Bukhari are objecting to. They, they, they don't care how useful this material is. They don't care. They, they disagree with that policy of strictness with things dealing with law, mm -hmm. laxity with stuff dealing with this kind of other stuff. They disagree with that. They say, you have to be strict with everything. So that's why they're... And you can read this in the introduction of Muslim Sahih. This is what he says. He, this is the thing he's hammering on. Right. So back to the criteria then. What criteria do they lay out to determine whether a hadith is Sahih or not? What do they have to establish in the hadith and its chain? Yeah. To be the... Okay, so first of all, you have to, we have to remember that there's multiple ways you could decide if you think the Prophet actually said something. Right. Okay. So... If I say to you, there's a hadith, here's a hadith. Um, and this is actually a, uh, it's an alleged hadith. It's a forged hadith, but I'm going to tell you. It's okay. not just so the viewers slash listeners know this. Don't get confused, okay? Yes. Uh, the first thing God created is a horse, hmm. was the horse. The horse sweated, and then God created himself from the sweat. What do you think? Do you think the prophet said this or not? It sounds very strange. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds very. There's a couple. Let me. There's a couple of problems here, right? Yes. So first of all, like I don't, I don't know. Like, uh, is God created? The Quran talks about like lam yadid wa lam yulad, right? Yes. God's the creator. Yes. He's not created. Yes. So this hadith kind of contradicts the Quran, right? Yes. The Quran, you know, the idea that God is created from horse sweat. Yes. This is problematic. Yes. Okay. So one thing we do is we say, look, we have the foundation of our religion is the Quran, mm. has very important ideas in it. And this hadith is just, we, we, we literally, there's no human way, no conceivable way to reconcile this with the Quran. So yes. this is, it contradicts the Quran. Would there be any flaws in the isnad, in the chain of narration? There is no chain of transmission for this oh, hadith. Okay. That, that is, it's not even a chain. It's really? just something floating around and, and some idiot was you know, saying in Baghdad in like yes. 700 or something like that. Okay. Yes. Well, Baghdad wasn't founded in 700. Yes. 770. So, uh, second problem. Hmm. You seem like you're a pretty scientifically inclined guy. My appearance is no. very deceptive. <laughs> well, you have glasses. You know, come on. <laughs> you have those, those are kind of the, the, the NASA, NASA guy uh, glasses. Yeah. And Malcolm X glasses. Okay. So, uh, yes. So, the... Is there anything else problematic, maybe logically, with this hadith? God created the horse, the horse sweated, then he created himself from the sweat. Hmm. Well, I mean, the point you made, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not created. Okay, so that's, that's that. okay. Allah creates a horse, and then from the horse, Allah is created. That doesn't, you yeah, know, it's that a, doesn't, so that's the, logically the, flawed, The right? effect is preceding the cause. Yes. It's illogical. So yes. it base, it violates the kind of first principle of reason, yes. which is that you can't have the effect precede the cause. Okay. Okay. Yes. So in our critique of this hadith, we used two tools. We said it contradicts the Quran, 
that contradicts just fundamental premise of reason. Yes. Okay. Um, and you can see this, for example, in um, uh, Abu Hanifa's book, Al Alim al Muta'allim, a very early text, right. where he says, if you, if a hadith that says that, any hadith that says that an action makes you non Muslim, like, you know, let's say I go to this fancy whiskey shop across the street, I saw, mm. I just buy a big thing of whiskey, mm. and I start chugging it. Yes. Okay. Then I'm just being a bad Muslim, right? Yes. But I'm still Muslim. Yes. It's general Sunni principle, right? Actions don't make you not Muslim. You're just committing sins. You're just yes. a bad, you're just being a sinful Muslim, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, what he says, if you see a hadith that says that there's an action that makes you non-Muslim, it can't, the Prophet couldn't have said it. Right. Because now this is something that's not in the Quran, right? But it is in Abu Hanifa's understanding of the Sunnah and the teachings of the Prophet. Uh -huh. So he's saying, if we know the Prophet taught X, and you hadith, see a hadith that says not X or opposite of X, mm -hmm. it can't be a, something the Prophet said. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's not just that we're saying a hadith, so a hadith contradicts the Quran, it contradicts the established Sunnah of the Prophet, yes. it contradicts first principles of reason. It can't be something the prophet said because the prophet is not going to say something is illogical mm. right, or something impossible. Fine. Um, here's the problem. So that's 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 a, an approach to hadith criticism that all Muslim scholars agree with. Yes. You can go back to, you know, the early Muslim rationalists, the Mu'tazilites. They were big on this. You can go back to their bigger their opponents, the early Sunnis like Ibn Han, Ibn Hanbal. Mm. They might not say this. But they also agree with this. If you go and look in early Sunni books of Hadith criticism where they're actually laying out the rules that are written in like the 10 hundreds, they'll, they'll say any Hadith that contradicts the Quran, hmm. contradicts the established Sunnah of the Prophet, that contradicts reason, it can't be something the Prophet said. Right. Okay. So that's, that's one approach. Everybody agrees with it, but here's the problem. It's very hard in practice. Yeah. Very hard in practice. Why? Imagine I tell you this. I say, um, here's a hadith. It's I pretty sure it's in the Allahumma said. I I I think it might be in the Musnad of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, but I can't be sure. Mm. But I'm not sure. But it's not, it's a an early hadith, but it's not in a main collection. Right. That the 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 Prophet said, I I was shown God in the shape of an amrad. Amrad is a beardless youth, hmm. a young, beautiful boy. Hmm. The prophet said, I saw God in the shape, I was shown God in the shape of a young, beautiful youth. Hmm. Oh, right? Hmm. This is interesting. So early Muslim rationalists, like the Mu'tazilites, said, this is ridiculous. Right. This can't be something the prophet said. Why? Yes. The, the, uh, uh, the Quran says, There's nothing like unto God. He's the one who perceives you. You don't perceive. You, you, you don't have basar, perception of God. Yes. Okay? Let alone, he's like a beardless youth. I mean, maybe you see like light or something. I mean, if, I mean whatever. But I mean, this, this is absurd. It clearly contradicts the Quran. Yes. Okay. Um. Some early Sunnis, it's not that they agree with the idea of the Sadiq, hmm. but what they really don't like is people superpowering their reason. Right. Right. So what they say is, you know, Mu'tazilites, early Muslim rationalists, you know, what do you know? Like, God doesn't, you don't know the nature of God. Like, you don't know the unseen realm of the ghaib, mm. you know? And what the Quran, what does the Quran say about earlier communities? They go astray when they start to speculate about God. They start to uh, go away from revelation and start to like invent their own forms. They start to like do theology and speculation and all these things. Yes. So we need to stick to the sunnah of the prophet. We don't know the nature of God. We only know what the Quran tells us. If the prophet tells us this, we really don't have, we, we're not in a position to say, this contradicts the Quran because we, he's the one explaining the Quran to us. Hmm. So if he says this, we don't actually have um, the right to uh, to uh, kind of 
uh, re, re, uh, descent or whatever. Yes. Okay? Yeah. Now, the other Sunni scholars, very senior senior Sunni scholars like Abu Dhabi, hmm. say this this hadith is ridiculous. Of hmm. course, it's ridiculous. First of all, the chain of transmission is not that strong. Okay. Second of all, you know, you you exactly what we said before. You can't see the, this contradicts the Quran. Yes. Some Sunni scholars like Mulla Ali Qari is a famous scholar from Mecca, originally from Herat. He okay. died in 1610 of the, no, uh, 1606, uh, 1606, sorry, yeah. the common era. He says, maybe the prophet saw it in a dream. And you know, you can see whatever in a dream. I, I, the other day I had a dream and I saw like a giant hamburger walking around or something. That doesn't mean, so I, whatever, I'm not responsible for this. Hmm. So it's a dream. Hmm. Um, you can see like there, there's a lot of, you know, some scholars are kind of trying to figure out ways to accept it. Some yeah. scholars are clearly saying, no, it's unacceptable. But but why why are they trying to do that when the Isnad is, is unreliable? Okay, Th let's, use, let's use a different example that's yes. uh, maybe like more helpful in this regard. Okay. So there's a hadith, considered reliable chain of transmission, okay. which says that God, in the late, sometime late at night, God descends from the highest heavens to hear the prayers of those people who are still awake in prayer. Mm. Okay. Those early Muslim rationalists, the Mu'tazilites, they reject this. Right. Just out of out of hand. Why? They don't care how strong the chain, strong the chain of transmission is. Mm. Why? If God's moving, if he moves from here to here, what does that mean about God? Yeah. He means yeah. he's in a body. Yeah. Okay. Also, where is he moving around? Like, is he in creation? Is he outside in like some void or something? What, mm. Like God, if you're moving around, it means you're in space, you're in time, mm. you're in a body. And this all contradicts what we, how we conce conceptualize God in this, in the, sure. based on Quranic teachings. Mm. They just say we reject this. Uh, there are Sunni opponents, people like Ibn Hanbal al-Bukhari, would say, no, like the prophet said this. Hmm. Uh, where, 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 do, where do, what right do you have to, uh, to dissent? Also, they'll say, the Quran, in Surat Al, I think it's uh, Surat Al Fajr, hmm. it says, it says, what uh, the angels and God on the day of judgment will come, Saffa and Saffa, they'll come rank in rank. Right? They'll come like, but the, but the Mu'tazilites say, no, no, this is allegorical. Hmm. It's like the power of God is coming. It's like, okay, it's allegorical. Why don't you make this hadith allegorical too? Why don't, look, we're not saying God is like actually dropping down. Hmm. In fact, Sunni theologians would say it's like the power, it's the mercy of God that's coming down. It's almost like the, the, the metaphor of like a parent kind of leaning over their child to hear what they're saying. So right. it's, we're not we're not saying God moves. It's just metaphorical. Yes. Right? So when we say, you know, God's God's eyes are on us, mm -hmm. we don't literally think God has eyes like yes. human eyes. It just yes. means God's aware of what we're doing. Right. So they're saying if you're willing to interpret this Quranic verse allegorically, why are you so quick to dismiss this hadith? Uh -huh. So the rules we mentioned before, if a if a hadith alleged hadith contradicts the Quran, contradicts the establishment of the Prophet, contradicts first principles of reason. It can't be something the prophet said. The difference between, let's say, a Muslim rationalist like the Mu'tazilites and a Sunni is not in that they disagree with the rules, it's that how much they're willing to, how much kind of charity they're willing to potentially give a hadith right. before they contradict, before they say this can't be the, the Sunnah of the prophet. Hmm. So someone like Mullah Ali Qari with that hadith of the beardless youth, he's willing to give a lot of charity. He's saying sure. maybe it was a dream. Dehabi, also Sunni, he's, he's not so willing. Yes. Right? Uh, sometimes, okay, so let me uh, get back to your question, right? So here's this, this is why Sunni scholars focus on the Isnad. Right. If you have the Quran, and if you understand the Quran through the Sunnah of the Prophet, it's very hard to know the difference between contradiction and explanation. Hmm. Okay. So if I say, 
uh, you know, the prophet said, for example, the, the, the Quran says that uh, meta, carrion, meat of a dead animal is prohibited for you. You find a dead animal, you can't eat it. Sure. But then the companions of the prophet, Laysa Salam, find a whale, a dead whale, washed up on the beach of the Red Sea, and they eat some of the meat. And then they tell the prophet later about this, Laysa Salam, and he doesn't say anything. He doesn't have a problem. And in fact, he says, the ocean is pure, and its dead are pure. Mm. So you can use the ocean, ocean water to do wudu, it's fine. And you can eat a dead fish from, mm. you know, or whatever. You can eat a fish even you don't uh, do like uh, cut its throat yes. or whatever. Yeah. You could say that hadith contradicts the Quran because the, the Quran says you don't eat carrion. Mm. But this hadith is explaining that that rule is applying to land animals, not to sea animals. Right. So it's how you need. To, it's very hard to know the difference between contradiction and explanation. Second, we don't know the unseen. God and the Prophet know the unseen, right? So, for example, if the Prophet says, uh, salam, says that on the day of judgment, we're going to see God, hmm. like you see the full moon. This is hadith, very famous hadith in yes. Sahih Bukhari and other yes. books. Mu'tazilites would say, God, this is impossible. You, it, again, God is in a body, he's receiving him. It goes against our theology as we understand it as Muslims. Mm. Early Sunnis say, no, no, wait a second. Listen, their judgment is a different universe. Like nothing we know is, it's a, a different creation. We have no, how, how are we going to, we're going to, you're going to sit around, we're going to say us human beings are just going around trying to like milk camels and you know, figure get enough food to eat and raise our kids and stuff like that. We don't we we don't even know what's going on in the world around us. We're gonna say what's possible and impossible in the uh, the next life. Hmm. This is only God's knowledge. If God and the prophet tell us something, we don't re we don't have a right to object. Of course, then some Sunni scholars, probably the majority, would say, okay, yes. It's not, maybe you're not actually seeing God. Maybe God creates an image in your mind or something. So they, they reconcile it. So the second thing is, it's we don't, the, the, the prophet is telling us about things. We don't have the capacity to object. We don't have the knowledge to object to. Yes. All right. Uh, so if we, if there are serious constraints on our ability to kind of examine the contents of these hadiths, hmm. what do we do? Well, we're going to look at the change of transmission. So what do they do? They, they say, first of all, if somebody comes and tells you something, you know, the prophet said this, the first thing they do is they have to provide a chain of transmission. They mm -hmm. have to provide an isnad. Uh -huh. Like the, uh, the famous scholar, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak said, al-isnad min ad-deen, lawla al-isnad, laqal man yashat man yashat. The isnad is part of the religion. Yeah. If it weren't for the isnad, whoever wants could say whatever they wanted. Uh -huh. Right. So if I come to you and say, you know, um, I just heard... You know, someone comes to you and says, Jonathan Brown just told me, you know, such and such a thing. Yes. How do you know that? Or, who told you that? He so, said this. Thing. Social media told me. Yeah, I say, you know, say, who said this? Like, yes. what's your chain? Where's, what's your source? Anything that we don't perceive or experience ourselves mm. comes to us through some kind of chain of transmission. Hearing, seeing um, a report, seeing a video, hearing a story from secondhand, thirdhand, right? So everything that's not perceived by us by our senses comes through some kind of uh, intermediary chain of transmission yes so first of all you have to have a chain of transmission second of all the chain of transmission has to be reliable so if somebody says you know hey i heard that um you know tomorrow uh, all the flights out of heathrow are canceled i mean i'm traveling tomorrow inshallah so uh i'll be like who told you that? Mm. I mean, think about it. Even common sense. Yeah, who told you that? Mm. Some guy on the street. Oh, some guy on the street told you that. Okay, well, that's really interesting. Yeah. Maybe I'll by the maybe I'll go check. This is actually interesting because imagine somebody tells you, some guy just told me that. Yes. Would you ignore it or would you actually go like online and look up Heathrow? I would do that, right? I'll be yeah. like, maybe that guy knows what he's talking about. I would yeah. check. Yeah. Let me tell you, let me ask you this question. Let's say somebody comes up to you and says, did you know that chocolate ice cream is like bad for your health? 
And then and then you say, well, who told you that? Some guy on the street. Yeah. Would you check that out? No. No, I'd be like, okay, whatever. Yeah. Why? Some things are important to us. Some things are not important to us. Remember what the early Sunni scholars said. There's certain things we're really strict on. There's certain things we're not strict on. Hmm. So let's say it's an important thing, yeah. the Heathrow Airport thing. You're going to go, but let's say you don't, there's no internet. This right. is before the internet. Yes. Right? What do you do? You go and you find out. Well, for, well, first of all, you'd say, you know, some idiot told you this, but you go ask your other friend, did you hear this? Hmm. Yeah, actually, um, you know, Muhammad, my friend Ahmed told me this. Ahmed, eh? Like, I mean, so you go and you find out what are other things Ahmed said? This is the same Ahmed who told me that he told you once that, uh, you know, um, I don't know, like uh, human beings are uh, actually capable of, you know, memorizing, you know, or the human beings, like, you know, if they eat chewing gum, it stays in their stomach for their whole life or something like that. Yeah. That's the same Ahmed, yeah. the same Ahmed who told me all this other stuff. Yeah. So I know that Ahmed. I've heard the stuff he says. It's not reliable. Yeah. But let's say it's Ahmed who, you know, this guy's like everything he's ever told you turns out to be correct. Then you're probably going to believe the thing about Heathrow Airport. Mm. Okay. So there's the question. So first of all, you have to have a chain of transmission. And then you have, to, how do you know the chain of, the person in the chain of transmission is reliable based on their track record? So in this case, you know Ahmed, you know his history. He's a serious guy. He's yeah. thoughtful. He doesn't lie. He doesn't exaggerate. He's not stupid, right? Um, but let's say you don't know this person. Hmm. You go and you find out who are their students, or who heard stuff from them. Uh -huh. Okay, this guy, you know, let's say Abu Bakr heard something from him. Abu Bakr said, Ahmed told me A, B, C, D. Then I go to another student, let's say Sara. She says, Ahmed told me A, B, C, D. Okay, you go to another student, uh, Haytham. Haytham says, Ahmed told me A, B, C, D. So actually, it seems like everything they're saying Ahmed says is corroborated by other people. Mm. Now, let's say I, instead of Ahmed, it's like another guy, Tariq. I go to his students. They say, Tariq told me A. Another one, he told me B. Another one, he told me C, D. These guys are not really corroborating mm. what this person said. So that person doesn't have a strong reliability. So you go back for each link in the chain of transmission and you do this. Right. Who are their students? What are their students saying they transmitted? Are they corroborating one another? Then you have to make sure they actually met one another. So let's say you ask me like, uh, uh, who told you this information about, uh, you know, who told you he throws clothes tomorrow? Hmm. Um, you know, Rishi Sunak told me this. Like, did you meet Rishi Sunak? Did you talk to him about this? I know you never met him. You know, you've been sitting at home all day. Like, you know, and, and you don't, you never go to like wherever these, uh, wherever like the they politicians hang yeah. out, right? Yeah. So you never hang out there. So I, I don't think you actually met this guy. Or let's say I tell you, you know, I, I say, where did you get these glasses from? Hmm. Malcolm X gave them to me. Hmm. I was like, you were born this year. He died this year. It's impossible. Hmm. There has to be some intermediary. And you're not telling me who it is. If I don't know who the intermediary is, that person could be a lunatic. Hmm. It could be a liar. So anytime there's a break in the chain of transmission, automatically this is unreliable. Right. But let's say I have, I figured out this person met this person. He met his teacher. She met her teacher, right? Et cetera. Back to the prophet, alayhi salam. Each person I've checked, are they reliable based on their corroboration? Yes. That's a strong chain of transmission. Now, what makes it even, what's even more important isn't just that you have one chain of transmission, but that it's transmitted by lots of people. Right. So, if the Prophet said something, it's probably the case that multiple people narrate this from him. I mean, or if let's say you're a really important scholar like Malik ibn Anas from, mm -hmm. from Medina, mm -hmm. unless you're like the most senior student of Malik who studied with him the longest, chances are there's lots of people who are going to narrate this from him. Yes. So if you only have one person narrating from him, mm, it's getting suspicious. Why isn't there more? Why, why aren't there more people? So it's not just that you have to have a sound chain of transmission. You also that chain of transmission also has to be corroborated for a hadith to be very strong. So are you saying that the scholars of hadith went through this pretty involved process to determine whether a hadith is sahih or not? Oh yeah. And ha you know, it seems like it's so involved it would probably take a lot of time up. Oh yeah. You know, it's it's a very 
Yeah, so it's an intense process. Yeah, very intense. I mean, it's 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 difficult to when you read about what they're doing, it's yeah. difficult to keep up. Like it's right. hard. It's I'm at like the edge of my capacity mm. even trying to track what they're doing, mm. let alone replicate what they're doing. And what's the relationship then between a muhaddif on the one hand who's uh, at the later stages you describe they're responsible for determining whether a hadith is sahih or not? Um, and a mushtahid who's responsible for giving uh, judicial verdicts or mm. Islamic verdicts. Uh, are mushtahideen muhaddifin by definition or do they rely on the muhaddif to yeah. supply them with hadith? So an important thing to, keep in mind, thing to keep in mind is that the, like, you know, let's say the different schools of law, they emerge from, the Hanifi school emerges from Abu Hanifa and his companions mm. in the mid 700s mm. in Kufa. Yeah, right. Uh, Maliki school emerges from Malik and his students in Medina in the late 700s, early 800s. Yeah. Shafi school, students of Shafi in Egypt, and then after him, Hanbali school from students of Abu, Abu, uh, Ibn Hanbal in Baghdad in the mid 800s. Mm. These all predate, remember, the, the six books are compiled in the mid to late 800s. Yes. This is all uh, post the actual emergence of these schools of law. So it's not like, you know, Imam Shafi or Abu Hanifa was like, oh, I need to do a med- I need to make a medhab. Yeah. So like, go get me the books of Hadith so I can figure out what to do. Yeah. Right. They have their own, they're collecting their own material. Abu Hanifa is collecting Hadith that are circulating in Kufa. Imam Shafi is going around to different parts of the different cities of the Muslim world collecting material, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so their 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 understanding of Islamic law is based on their school, its approach, right? Uh, the collection of hadiths mm-hmm. in the, in the books that are that we know of, right, are is a separate process. Right now, it doesn't mean it's you know isolated from that. For example, uh, scholars who scholars who um, the scholars who compiled the six books, mm. they're not like neutral people. They're mm. not like, you know, I'm not in a medhab. I don't want to get in these debates. Mm. They're all coming out of the tradition of Ibn Hanbal and Imam Shafi. Yes. So what's called the Ahl Hadith tradition. They're not um, They're not big fans of Abu Hanifa. Yeah. Hayyimullah. They're, they disagree with him on, on issues. Yes. I mean, they disagree with him. I shouldn't say they're not big fans. They, they have disagreements with him. So... The six books are an expression of basically what would be become the Shafi and the Hanbali schools right. of law. Now, uh, what then happens is, so that's, let's say we're getting into the 800s of the Common Era, mid late 800s, early 900s of the Common Era. Mm. Some scholars from the Hanafi tradition, especially a guy, an Egyptian scholar named At-Tahawi, mm. who dies in... 932 of the Common Era. He actually studies with, his uncle is one of Shafi's senior students. Yes. He starts out as a student in the Shafi tradition. He becomes Hanafi. What he does, is, but he learned the, the, the Sunni science of Hadith criticism. So what he goes and he does is he collects all these Hadiths and he kind of puts them through the, the Sunni critical process. And then he says, he backs up the Hanafi school of law, its rulings with, Hadith. Hmm. Then there's a scholar in the uh, uh, in uh, what's now Lisbon, named Ibn Abd al Bar. He dies in uh, 10, uh, 463, 1070 of the Common Era, named Ibn Abd al Bar. He does the same thing for the Maliki school. Really? There's a scholar in he's from Bayhaq, which is near kind of between Nishapur and Tehran today. Scholar named Behaqi, dies 1066 of the Common Era. And he does the same thing for the Shafi school, right? So what they do is these, these different schools of law will go and say, okay, we're now going to um, back up and kind of prove all our legal rulings with these hadiths and using our, our shared method of hadith criticism. Fantastic. Oh, and but let me ask, sorry, yeah, you, you, yeah. You, you, asked, you answered another, asked another question, but I forgot to answer, right? Yeah. This debate about kind of division of labor yes. uh, is a really important one, right? 
a jurist, a faqih, is different from a hadith scholar. Mm. Hadith scholar studies hadith, maybe uh, tr tries to authenticate them, uh, collect different versions, figure out which ones are stronger, maybe even explain the hadith. The job of a jurist is different. The job of a jurist is to provide answers to legal questions. Yes. Can I eat this? How do I treat my mother? Um, you know, can I buy Bitcoin or whatever, right? Uh, there could be Hadith scholars who are also jurists, mm. like Malik Bukhari. B Bukhari was a Hadith scholar and a jurist. Um, there could be Hadith scholars who are not jurists, like, for example, Ibn Abi Hatim al-Razi, who mm. died in um, about 938 of the Common Era. He's from Ray, what's today Tehran. Mm. He, uh, he's just a Hadith scholar. He doesn't write legal opinions and stuff. Hmm. And you have, you have scholars who are jurists and not Hadith scholars. So, for example, Al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali Al -Ghazali knows more about Hadith than you and me times 10. Hmm. Okay, so this is not to say he's like, he's, you know, he knows he a knows huge amount about Hadith. Yes. But that's not a specialization. Right. A specialization is theology, law, Sufism, right? Uh, that's, those are his books he writes. So for him, by that time, by the time he's living in the, the 10 hundreds of the common era, he's got the six books. He's got other book, books of Hadith. If he wants to go look stuff up and use it, he'll say, he'll say this book, and he'll, he'll give his evidence. Say, this book, this Hadith that I'm using is in this book mm. to sort of show its strength. Mm. Or its scholars have said it's Sahih or said it's Hassan. Yes. So he's a jurist. So, but you have different, that's a different job. Mm. Just if you... For example, if sometimes a lot of misunderstanding happens when people think that you just, you know, you want to know an answer uh, to a legal question, and what do you do? You just go look at hadiths. Hmm. This is this is ignorance, right? Because no Muslim scholar that I know of who's worth their salt would ever have recommended this, right? Because as I said before, let's say I go and I, I go and see this hadith about the Prophet used to do would do after he ate cooked meat. I'd be like, oh my God. <laughs> Everybody's been doing this wrong. You know, everybody, quick. You just ate this biryani. Don't pray. Mm. You have to do wudu first. I just saw this hadith. Look, people for 1,400 years have been doing this work. Mm. They take the hadiths. They figure out how they fit together. They figure out how they relate to interpretation of schol scholarly interpretation. Figure out how it relates to community pra communal practice. Mm. These different ways of understanding the sunnah. They take this, they put it in relationship with the Quran, they figure out how it relates to a specific you know, time and circumstance, and then they come up with a legal ruling. Right. That's the job of jurists. Right. So the mistake, it's not that you know, hadiths, if you study hadiths, you're not, you don't understand Islamic law, or you study Islamic law, you don't understand hadiths. You could do both. The mistake is to think that you can answer legal or theological questions just by randomly go to, going to hadiths and kind of picking this and that. Hmm. Because that's, not the process that Muslim scholars followed. Whether they're Salafi or Madhabi, no, no people would recommend this. Mm. Now, I know that time is against us and you have to move on to your next uh, appointment, but I would like to ask you a few questions about the modern context. So recently online, there was a debate or a discussion about uh, the about Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, and, <clears throat> and his uh, hadith. And um, the <coughs> argument put forward, in this case by some women activists, was that uh, his hadith tend to, you know, they tend to uh, confirm a very misogynistic view of the world. And um, uh, <laughs> then they question uh, whether he really had the ability uh, to, to relay uh, the hadith of the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had only been a Muslim for three or four years, I think it was, uh, prior to the, the passing of the messenger. Um, how would you respond to and, and there are lots of debates like this all the time by all sorts of by liberal minded people, by postmodernists, by socialist mind, you know, where uh, they question parts of the hadith based on uh, and, and sometimes they go back to the original sources and, and, and argue that the, the, the narrators, the, fundam the source narrators were fundamentally flawed. Um, yeah. What's, and th th yeah so this point, is yeah. the. As they say, we've seen this movie before, right? <laughs> so, 
tenet. M- Muslim yeah. scholars, <laughs> Muslim scholars have been debating this since the 700s. I'm not joking. Right. In mm. the court of the Abbasid Caliph mm. in the late 700s, there was a there was a debate between some of the um, kind of more rationalist scholars uh, who were with the Caliph. <clears throat> And this uh, early Sunni named Omar bin Habib, who died 820 of the Common Era. Yeah. And guess what they're saying? Hmm. The rationalists were saying, Abu Hanifa is not a jurist. He's not reliable. You can't take material from him. Yeah. And what Omar bin Habib says is, listen, you've you got to be really careful. If you're suggesting that the companions of the Prophet don't understand the Prophet's Sunnah, how are you going to get the, the Sunnah of the Prophet? You, they, they're essential either through their transmission of a hadith or their understanding of his tradition of problem solving, yeah. they're an essential bridge. So be very careful. Right. This is a debate has been going on for, what is that, like 1,200 years? Mm-hmm. It's a long time. Mm. And here's the thing about Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala, I know. One, he very rarely narrates hadith that's not narrated by somebody else. So almost all the hadith Abu Huraira narrates are narrated by other companions. Mm. So let's say you get rid of all of these hadiths. They're still going to be narrated. You know, most of the material is already coming from other companions. Right. Second, the, the people say, oh, we only knew the Prophet for three years. Yeah, okay. But, you know, Ibn Abbas was like only 14 years old when the Prophet died. Mm. He narrates, you know, thousands of hadith too. So how's this? Because they, as I said before, they're not quoting the Prophet most of the time. They're, they just say the Prophet said, or they say, I heard this from another companion. Yeah. So they're getting they're getting it from an intermediary. And you can say, well, why don't they say that? Because at that point in history, people aren't obsessively, for example, when I, when you, um, if you tell me like, you know, the prime minister said this, hmm. prime minister said that. Yeah. You say, I saw on BBC, I read in the Guardian. Yeah. I mean, you could, mm. but we get kind of, I'd get kind of bored. I'd be like, listen, could you stop telling me all like the weird places you read this? Just tell me what happened, right? Yeah. So we, in our, that's how they're in that, especially in their first generation of Muslim, they're not obsessively saying, I heard this from this companion. Or that. So they, they, he, he just says, the prophet said. Mm. Even scholars like Ibn Hajj al Asqalani, big hadith scholar from Cairo, who died in 1449, he says, in terms of the Sahih hadiths that Ibn Abbas transmits, Ibn Abbas transmits, yeah. he probably only heard 40 hadiths from the Prophet right. directly. Everything else he's getting from another companion that he, okay. he either mentions or he omits mm-hmm. to mention. Mm-hmm. That's not a problem in the early period because they didn't have this. In, we, it would be like me going back and insisting that every anything you didn't, Anytime you quoted like a British politician and didn't say where you read it, I'm just, I'm going to ignore it. Right. I mean, I can't go back and ask you to act in a way that wasn't required from you at the time or expected from you at the time. Yeah. So that's the thing about, and it's kind of weird that people keep bringing this up about Abu Huraira because it's very easy to explain. Yes. But the third thing is, you know, about him being a misogynist. Hmm. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, if you go in Sahih Muslim and you open up a chapter about, it's on the description of Jannah and its blessings. There's a report where there's it's the Prophet has died. There's people. De- there's just some people debating in Medina. They're having a little debate. Mm. Are there more women in in paradise than men? Mm. And they go to Abu Huraira, and he's he he's like mm, he thinks about. it. He said, "Okay, I think there are more women." He says, "Why? Because every man is gonna." The Prophet said, "Every man is gonna have like more than one wife in paradise." Mm-hmm. So if there's more than one wife, then mm-hmm. that means there's more women than men. Mm-hmm. That's his own calculation. His own. He's thinking about. Okay, I think this. Yes. That's not a hadith of the prophet, but that's uh, Abu Huraira doing legal reasoning. Yes. So you can criticize him for being right or wrong or whatever, but he's not saying oh, definitely men because women are <laughs> women. You know, suck or something, right? So yes. I don't understand. How, is this is Abu Huraira the misogynist? Yes. So I think this is um, people. As I said before, the difference, let me, let me rephrase that, right? Every Muslim scholar in history has acknowledged that hadith forgery is a serious problem. Mm. Okay? That's why there is a science of hadith criticism in the Islamic tradition. Right. 
every Muslim scholar that I know of in Islamic history has, you know, either they have openly acknowledged it or they belong to a tradition that acknowledges that a hadith can't contradict the Quran, it can't contradict the established son of the prophet, mm. it can't contradict the first principles of reason, because those things can't be things the prophet said, mm. right? Oh, by the way, another thing they say is a hadith can't be racist. Mm. So if you have a hadith that's like insulting a whole group of people or a whole race, it can't be something the prophet said. Because mm. people talk about this a lot today. Mm. Um, now, th this is agreed upon. Where is the disagreement? How you apply this test? How willing are you to be charitable and offer uh, time to reconcile between like the Quran and a, and a potential hadith? Yes. How humble are you? Right. One of the things you see in kind of Islamic modernists or kind of progressive Muslims is, uh, let's just say, a significantly reduced level of humility. A, a, a certainty about their moral or scientific view of the world hmm. and not being willing to say like, you know what, maybe God and the prophet know better than us on something. That's, I think, the, the, what's really an issue. So in some ways, the, these debates, although they might be about Abu Huraira or about you know, whether we believe hadiths or not, hmm. that's not really what the debate is. The debate is how willing are we to subordinate what people around us are saying are the certainties, the moral certainties, the mm. political certainties, whatever, scientific certainties of our world. Mm -hmm. How willing are we saying these are more powerful than the message of God and his prophet? That's what we're, we're saying. That's the, the debate, right? Yes. Or are we saying that if we're going to be Muslim, it can only be an Islam that is really defined by, let's say, progressive sensibilities? Mm. Or should progressive sensibilities have to stand the test of the core message of the Sunnah, of the Quran, and the Sunnah of the Prophet. Like these are the really debates that are happening. Uh, lastly, um, Dr. Brown, what's the rule regarding the person who, at the very beginning, you said there are some Muslims or some people who argue that we should just abide by Quranic injunctions and not the Hadith. Now, notwithstanding all that you've said, that the Hadith explains the Quran, and you cannot delink the two, and it's impossible to just follow the Quran. But notwithstanding that, if someone insisted that the hadith corpus um, I reject as a complete source of sharia. What is the hukum shari'i regarding that person? You know, he's he's state of Islam. Yeah, so, um, like, first of all, I'm not uh, like a mufti and sure. I'm not qualified to give legal rulings or something. Yes. But I can tell you how other people have answered Please. this question, yes. right? So, uh, I mean, first of all, it just as a kind of, Deep, sort of baseline, right? The general answer of Muslim scholars like Al Hafid al Iraqi, who died 806 Hijri, Mullah Ali Qari, I mentioned him already, died uh, 1014, 1606 of the Kaaban era. Yes. So, is to say, and this is generally shared, right? If you reject something that's mutawatir, that means massively transmitted mm. from the Prophet, or like the Quran, that's mutawatir, right? Mm. If you reject something like this, like the Prophet existed, the Prophet's name was Muhammad, right? That he lived in Med Mecca and he moved to Medina. And mm. he told us that uh, we're not supposed to drink wine and mm. we're not supposed to eat pork, right? If you reject this kind of thing, you wouldn't be you would not be Muslim. Right. Now, um if you if it's just an isolated report, so let's say um uh, a um even one that's sahih. So let's hmm. say something like, uh, Allahumma says Muhammad. Like, um, okay. I mean, let's just use this one. Like, the, hmm. you know, someone could say that the Prophet said that there's, you know, more women in hellfire than men. Hmm. If you reject this, then you're you could be this could be sinful. You hmm. could be wrong. You hmm. could be misguided. But yeah. you're still Muslim. Yes. In the middle tier, there's something called mashur or mustaf mustafid hadith. These are hadith that are not massively transmitted, yes, but they're all they're very well known. They're not kind of single narrations. Yes. One opinion is that if you reject this, you wouldn't be Muslim. But yes. Mullah Ali Qari, and I think he's correct in saying this, that you know you would be misguided, you would be sinful in this, but you're still Muslim. Right. I think that's the correct position. Yes. Okay. Uh, and to this, I would add. 
something that um, the Mufti of Egypt, Muhammad Bakhit al Muti'i, mm. he died in 1935. He was an Egyptian, the chief, uh, head Mufti, of, the chief Mufti of Egypt in the 1930s, 20s, and 30s. And he has a really interesting uh, discussion with these kind of young, really like kind of westernized Egyptians, you know, wearing suits and stuff. And they're just saying, you know, we shouldn't follow the sunnah, we should follow custom and whatever the custom of our time is. And he's he's kind of, he's describing this interaction and he's very merciful to them, right? He says, it's like some people, if they say they don't believe a hadith, it's not because they, they're not rejecting the prophet. They love the prophet. Hmm. They, they love the prophet very much. And what they're saying is, I don't feel like this something he would say, hmm. you know? So in some ways, their rejection is actually a love of the prophet. And in that case, he's not like, you know, his, his response isn't to say, um, you know, you're a kafir or you're misguided or something like that. It's not, that's not the, that's not the way to think, right? Yeah. The way to think is this person has love for the prophet. That's why they're trying, they're, they, they want to be Muslim. Hmm. So the answer isn't to, to kind of condemn them or drive them away or something. Yes. It's to try to help them understand better. And that's, I think, a very important thing to keep in mind because a lot of, you know, when you have discussions about this or you see debates about this, I mean, Usually, I mean, sometimes it's non-Muslims, but usually it's people who are Muslim. They, they want to be Muslim. Like yes. if you meet like Parvezi people from Pakistan mm. or, you know, people who are like Quran only Muslims, mm. they want to be Muslim. And I, you know, they're, they just see Hadith and they don't understand how to deal with them. Yeah. So the, the answer isn't to kind of say, well, you guys are misguided or you guys aren't Muslim. Or if you say this, then it's, you know, you know, this is the consequence. I think the most the help, most helpful thing to do is actually help them right. understand Good. Uh, how, like, first of all, it's very important to tell them, like, listen, you have a problem with Hadith and your, your, your instinct is fine. Like mm -hmm. you, our religion doesn't say, just believe whatever anyone tells you, right? Mm -hmm. You're supposed to, right? We, the Quran tells us, we believe stuff when we have proof, when someone brings us revelation, when someone brings us evidence. That's what makes, that's why I'm Muslim. That's why I decided to become Muslim. It's like, listen, I'm, I'll believe stuff, but you got to give me evidence. Yes. And if you hear something that seems to contradict the Quran, that seems to contradict what you know about the Prophet, that seems to contradict reason, you have every right to be skeptical about this and to say, like, I don't think this is a hadith. Hmm. The problem is when you, refuse to have any discussion about this or when you think you automatically know better than everybody else. Mm. So sometimes this is kind of like a know-it-all competition. Like you have two different know-it-alls, the kind of traditional Muslim, like I know everything, you need to listen to me. And the like, modernist Muslim progressive, I know it all, you need to listen to me. I think what is really important in these discussions is that people have humility and like compassion for the other. And this is funny because out of all the like Facebook debates I've gotten in, all like the Twitter wars, all the personal debates I've ever had on these issues. Yeah. The only time I have ever changed my, someone's mind wasn't when I brought them evidence or when I gave the best argument. It was when I was just, I mean, I, I had to be, I thought I had like the compassion thing on like 12. You know, I turned the dial up to 11. I was just so compassionate. I was so, I was like, I understand you think this. I understand, you know, that was the only time I've ever had any, somebody change their mind. It had nothing to do with evidence or who's right or wrong. It had to do with being compassionate to why they thought something. And then, then they were, there was, people, we were able to like reach one another. Dr. Jonathan Brown, Jazakallah Khair for your time today. It's been a fascinating discussion. I loved it. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.